just so you guys I'm I'm here I'm ready to go so You know how people are. They're always late, so give them a few minutes today. Does anyone have any questions while we're waiting? Does anyone have anything they have in their mind they want to ask me? Um, any questions related to any contracts? Uh, Sam.gov, HubZone, Ostabu, Small Business Specialists, uh, Forecast Lifts, anything like that? If you do, let me know. Now's a great time. I mean, the way this is going to work is essentially, you know, I'm going to go through, I'm going to talk about fear and failure and government contracting and share some of my experiences. But uh, really, this is for you guys. Um, so I want to leave it kind of open format and allow people to chime in and ask questions. So we've got about a minute left and we'll get started. By the way, um, as you probably already know, if you're not aware, uh, everything that we stream today, it's going to be uploaded on the site tomorrow. So it'll be on YouTube tomorrow. It just, for some reason, because they're, these videos are about an hour long, it takes a while to get upload. So, uh, But it'll be on the site tomorrow. So if you've got to go for whatever reason, uh, this will be up tomorrow. And I've got some new upcoming videos that are really good. So look out for those. All right, so it's 6.05. We're going to go ahead and get started because um, I want to be on time and get you guys out of here. So today I want to talk about fear and failure in government contracting. And the reason why I chose this topic today is because a lot of people, they reach out to me. Um, a lot of the YouTube subscribers, they call me um, or they reach out and they want me to call them. And I've done a bunch of one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. And I get a lot of the same questions over and over again. And if, if you guys call me or if you, if you reach out to me and you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session, um, I've, you know, I, I, in, the, in the initial beginning, I was offering that to people free, and I still it's still free. But the only difference is now, if I do one-on-one -on -one sessions, I want to be able to record the information because I was giving away gems to people, and it wasn't able to share that information with you guys, my subscribers, my base. So you know, if I don't, if I give someone some information that I can't then turn around and spread with others, it wasn't really helping the, the whole group as an organization. So. I decided to create, you know, go live Tuesdays and Thursdays as a way of being able to disseminate the information to all persons at once. But a lot of the times the people ask me the same questions. And the first thing when I get on the phone with anyone, I ask, who is your customer? And if you don't know who your customer is, then I, I'm not really understanding because if you found me via YouTube and you see my videos, this is one of the, the this video is a, a fairly old video it's maybe four or five months old but it tells you does it come and buy what I sell and so I couldn't figure out why were people asking me these questions when I have videos that already discussed this and then the next question they would ask well Eric tell me um, what about you know now who, who you know who wants to buy dog food or who wants to buy pet supplies and they were and I said well I've got a video did you see my video on forecast list and the only conclusion that I was able to reach was essentially this, was fear. These, to me, in my opinion, are, uh, these are action steps, but they're low impact, meaning they don't really cause a lot of anxiety, they don't cause a lot of pain, and so I can't understand why people were not doing those things. And that's the reason why I decided, okay, before we continue teaching more GovCon stuff, let's talk about what some of the root of the problems, because, you know, if you, I have a 12-day course, I have a book, I've got 49 plus videos, I mean, I'm, you, I have an action plan, I have, uh, you know, I have a bunch of resources already available that you can start doing stuff now. You have, a, you, you're, you're basically equipped with enough information to start actually doing things and winning contracts. In fact, I just put up a video last week, um, this video here, and this video is a direct result 
of a conversation that I had with a YouTube subscriber. This was the direct result of a one-on-one -on -one call that I had with a YouTube subscriber who said, Eric, I've got a solicitation. I want to put in a bid. Show me how to do it. We walked through the whole thing. I don't know if he turned in the bid or not, but then I went back and made a video regarding you know, the experience, and then I reached out and called the person. The award went and asked if he needed help with this project, and if you guys have seen the video, then you know what happened at the end of the day. He said, yes, he does need some help, and so... We were, you know, I didn't know anything about this job, but it was just to demonstrate an example that the teachings that are already that are already online right now, as it speak, you could start implementing those today. And so, uh, effectively, I said, okay, there's got to be a bigger problem out here. There's got to be something that I'm missing. Why are people not doing these things? You know, and I have two friends of mine that I know personally that. They come to me and they say, Eric, well, can you t teach us a video about this and teach me a video about that and teach me a video about this other thing? And I go, you don't need to know all this stuff. I mean, I don't know every single aspect of the FAR. I don't know every single aspect of the rules and regulations of contracts. I don't care about that stuff. But what I do know is the information pertinent to get me a contract. And that's the information I'm sharing with you guys. I don't want you to learn all the different FAR clauses because it's not applicable in helping you to win contracts. All, this, it, all those things do is delay you from doing the activities that are going to yield you the results that you're looking for to get contracts. So let's talk today about some of the root of the problem, fear and failure, um, their brother and sister or cousins, whatever you want to say. So let's, let's talk today about some of the root of the problem. That takes me to a story. Um, about a month ago, I was down in Miami and I was speaking um, at this conference. It was this um, set, set up by BizTech11. And so it was since it was in Miami, the by the way, Ricky, I see your question. I'll uh, I'll respond to it in just a moment. But I mean, in order to get in the course everywhere is on there. You can go to my um, I have a video on GovCon Giants and in, and in all the show notes page is a link to the course. Just go ahead and click on there and sign up and it'll start sending you the 12 day course via email. Make sure you subscribe and also make sure anyone who hasn't signed up for the course, make sure you check your spam folder. Um, because sometimes the messages go into your spam folder. But going back to the story, so I was in Miami speaking at this organization, and because I was in Miami, and this was October, and like I tell everyone, I want to bring you the most relevant content, the most relevant information in 2017. You know, if you look over my left hand shoulder, a lot of these books that I have here, you know, this top book was written in 2008. That's not going to do you any good today. Well, I want to bring you the most relevant content, the most things that are applicable to you and your situations, what's going on right now in the marketplace today. So I was there at this conference. And so what I did was I said, OK, we're in Miami. The hurricane just happened. You know, a lot of the issues were revolving uh, debris removal contracts. And I, I personally don't do this. So what I did was the morning of and if you can see here at the top right corner, you can see what time it was. I put this together. It shows it on the screen, clear as day, 6.14 a.m. I went and pulled this up literally the morning of, and I said, let me go and look up the history on contracts in Miami-Dade County that involved debris removal. So I went ahead and I pulled this information up, and you can see there that it shows you right there at the bottom, 2006, the Miami-Dade County spent $328 million in emergency debris removal services. 2009, another 164 million, 2010, 164, 2012, 164. And then in 2012 to 2018, they put out another uh, contract for an, with another $100 million allocation. If you look closely, um, and if you're watching this on your phone, it's probably hard to do, but if you look closely, they all have the kind of the same number, 6417. So you, I'm saying to myself, okay, uh, I went and pulled this down, it's public information, they're spending $160 million every time there's a hurricane. So what I did was I went a step further and I said, all right, let me go and pull down the actual, and this is what you're looking at here. Let me pull down the actual bid for the debris removal contract and find out who were, this was the award sheet. This is the actual award sheet from Miami-Dade County and who was on the list, 6417, right? So this you see where it says contract period, 10, 2012 to 2018. So I went and pulled down this list. And you can see right here on this list, remember, they spent $164 million every time there was a natural disaster for debris removal. And you can see here are the names on the list, their phone numbers. There's one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. There you go. So there was a total of thirteen companies on that list. Now, if you're in this business, why were you not on that list? Did you not anticipate another hurricane coming to hit Miami? I mean, what what were you thinking? Whose fault was it that you were not registered and put yourself in a position so that when a natural disaster did occur, you would have been ready for it? And so that's what I'm telling people. You can't, you know, you can't blame this on anyone else. And so the root problem, I believe, is just fear because why else would people who have the ability to do these services, who are qualified to do these services, why would you not want to you know, be on this contract? You don't need to hire a consultant to help you to get on that contract. You, know, you, don't, need, you don't need to hire anybody, you don't need to pay for any services. You basically submit your information pre-qualify and it wasn't a closed list, it was an open list. So anyone uh, was eligible for it. So then when the hurricane happened, you know, those people that were on the list, they were already in a position to go out and execute and perform and start getting paid from those contracts. And so that's just one example of, you know, why I'm, I'm trying to, instead of continuing to, at least today, instead of teaching you more information about, you know, winning contracts, I want to talk to people about fear and failure and see if I can help try and like change uh, some of your perceptions and your beliefs surrounding that. Because you know, my goal is with my channel is to help. Again, I've got the 2020 challenge. If you're not familiar with it, I want to help 200 companies get to 5 million revenue by the year of 2020. It's called the 2020 challenge. You can find it on my website. You can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, and so in order for me to, to do that, I need people to start doing some of these steps. Again, this is like an experiment for me. I mean, if you don't do the activities, then how do we get feedback, right? How do we know if the things are working, what's not working? Um, you know, and if you've gone through my 12 day course, then you've likely transitioned into my private Facebook group. And then in the private Facebook group, we share in on information, right? So if you're not in that, make sure you sign up for the 12-day course. And then once you get through the 12-day course around day 11, uh, you'll get an invite for to participate in my private Facebook group. And then I have to accept you to come into the group. I think right now we're at like 72 people in the private Facebook as of today. Um, so... You know, my thing is I need people to start doing these activities so that so that we can, um, you know, we can kind of find out where they're at, what's working, what's not working. And we could we could start adjusting from that. So let's let's talk today um, a little bit about fear and, you know, how do we handle fear and what does it look like? You know, it, it says um, and. and to help me today with this topic, we're going to reference a couple books here. I'm going to look at this book, John Maxwell, Failing Forward. And we're going to look at this book. It's called The 50th Law by Robert Greene. Actually, this is a really excellent book. When you, and if you want to know about conquering your fears um, and what that does for you, I mean, that, that book there, uh, The 50th Law, is a great read. So let's get started. Um, and the 50th law, it says the margin of control that we have over people and circumstances is narrow. However, there's one thing that we have control over, and that's mindset. And the, that's the mindset is which we respond to the events around us. And if, so if we ever overcome our anxieties and forge a fearless attitude towards life, something strange or remarkable can occur. So what we're going to focus on today is how do we forge a fearless attitude towards life? Um, you know, I'm out here doing the same thing. Today, this morning, I'm going to tell you guys, this is uh, funny. Um, so this morning, uh, I had a conference call. At, it was scheduled for 11 a.m. And I was really, I was afraid. I'm going to tell you, we are behind schedule on one of my projects. And um, it's not, it wasn't the fault of, of my installers. The manufacturer is not producing the material fast enough for us to put it on, on site. And we only have a few months left to complete this project, and it's a big project. And so for every day that we're late, the damages are $1,600 a day. And right now, we're looking at, we're probably uh, forecast about 45 days late. So you, you could do the math. It's probably ninety-eight, ninety-five thousand $95,000, something like that. So, you know, um, and the contractor who hired me, 
was already making, you know, threats and stuff like that. And, and so, I, you know, I said to myself, I, I didn't have any information, I didn't have any answers. And I was afraid. You know, I was, same thing like you guys go through, I was afraid. Um, but instead of, you know, curling up, and instead of balling up and, and, you know, saying, you know, thinking poor me, I said, what can I do? What steps can I take? How do I help try and mitigate some of this fear? And how do I get past that? And, um, you know, fortunately for me, I had already done all of the possible things that I could do that with, within my control, right, to get all the information possible that I had in preparation for that meeting. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, an hour before the meeting, I was very confident and ready for whatever they were going to uh, attack me with because I had already done all things possible and I had already did everything within my control and my ability that I could. And that's what I'm telling you guys is that let's talk about um, you doing at least the activities that are within your control. If I, if I encourage you to go out and reach out to the small business specialist, that is something that you have the ability to do. They are there for you. They have actually have uh, these people are in place to help you to do business with their agency. So if you're not reaching out to them, if you haven't picked up the phone and called them, if you haven't sent them an email, then they're 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 just sitting there idle and no one's using taking advantage of the services. Now, it's no different than FEMA or SBA. I mean, if no one is using these services, the people are there in place to assist you. So why would you not just pick up the phone? and give them a call. Hold on one second, let me see what we got here. Um, all right, let's see. Prolific buyers, fetal position never works for some reason. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. Um, AAA, we make time home care, hell alive, great information, just put in a bid in contact today. All right, good luck on that bid. Chizzo, chizzo, good luck. All right, great. So, getting back to what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, and um, so what happened to me was, you know, about about 30 minutes before the meeting, uh, the contractor that I hired sent me an updated schedule. We discussed the call, and 10 minutes before, we were ready to go. And um, essentially, we were able to answer the GC's questions and uh, at, the, at least be able to come up with a, a mutual agreed-upon resolution to where we can try to how to get out of the situation. So, you know, that's what I want to tell you guys. Now, again, so we're talking about your mindset um, and what... You know, they say in the book, it, you know, the Pete and the Fifth Law, what Robert Greene says, that it puts across certain qualities, so supreme boldness, unconventionality, fluidity, and a certain urgency. This gives us the unique ability to shape, shape our circumstances. So, you know, I've got over 3,000 views on my FBO video that I've been watched, and probably less than 1% of the people have actually attempted the exercises. That is my, by far my most successful video that I have out today, and no one is actually doing the exercises. I have, I, I think I've got 72 comments, 48 likes, but the people are not doing exercises. Every day people ask me for my letter of interest, I send it to them, and I'm wondering if they're even using it to solicit to the contracting officers. You know, and, and so that puzzles me, and, and that's kind of what, you know, I'm hoping that we could kind of try to fix some of this stuff. Now, going back, I, um, I don't know if you guys know the story about uh, Mike Tomlin from the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, his story. He was a coach. He was looking to coach in the college level. And so what happened was he wasn't getting any interviews. No one would, no one would interview him to be a college-level coach. And then um, he learned from a friend of his that there was a rule that the NFL had put in place recently where they had to interview so many black coaches. And that gave him an opportunity to interview for a coaching position. Well, um, the way it turns out, the Pittsburgh Steelers end up hiring him as a coach. He went, he skipped being a college coach and went straight to being a head coach. And then a few years later, he won the Super Bowl and the rest is history. So we don't know what happens, uh, what miracle is going to happen once we start stepping out there. We can't, we can't say what that's going to look like when we step out there. I'll give you another example. I was looking at buying some real estate. Um, recently, about maybe a year ago, I was buying some investment properties, and one of a friend of mine who's extremely successful in real estate, I you know I called him up for advice and I said, hey, you know Richard, listen, the real estate market is really tough. 
um, right now. And, you know, I mean, it's very competitive and people are, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult market to buy in. And he said to me, he said, Eric, he says, I like it when the real estate market is tough. He says, because when it's tough, only the people who can figure out how to get through that barrier are the people that are going to succeed. And so it gave me a different outlook. It gave me a different perspective on things. And that's kind of where I share with you guys through my videos. And I'm hoping to try and convey is that if you're down here, it's tough for you. I mean, you're going to have a tough road to plow. If you're hanging down here and you're fighting and you're scrounging at the bottom and you're looking for these little measly contracts, it's going to be a tough road to plow. If you do the things that the other people won't do, if you go out and you find out who's buying what you sell and you go meet with the people and you go talk to the people and you go do a presentation, those are the things that the average people are not doing right now. It's very easy to sit back in the comfort of your home and bid a job on FedBizOps. But if you, if you don't already know this, 50% of all the jobs don't even make it to FedBizOps. 50, it's 50, it's 55% of the jobs are on FedBizOps. So it's, I'm sorry. So it's 45% of all jobs have one or no bidder and they never see the light of day of FedBizOps. In fact, in my career of doing government contracts, I've only had one project, one, that I actually won off of FedBizOps. Every other project that I've done, including the, the ones that I'm working on currently today, that, that I'm actively working on right now as we speak, they never saw, they never met FedBizOps. So you're not going to find those projects by going on FedBizOps and sitting in the comfort of your home and not actually doing any activity. And so what I'm saying is, like Richard told me, when it's, when it's difficult, it makes it better for the people who are serious and the people who really have a hunger for this and the people who really want it. And I'm hoping that you, the people that are listening to me today and taking the time out to, to be on this channel, are the ones that are serious and the ones that really want it. Because those are the people who I want to spend my attention with and my time on and invest in them and help them get to the level where I'm at. Those are the people that I want to work with. All right. So let's um, let's go on. I, you know, one of the things that I like to say, are you choosing the activities based on your level of comfort or are you choosing your activities based on what will yield the maximum return? So look at that when you are actually out here and you're doing stuff and you're sitting before you make excuses, before you say how hard it is, before you say how difficult it is, before you say how much of a maze it is in government contracting, before you tell me how you know, you're know you confused and you don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn, how about let's just do some of the things that you already know. Forget about the stuff that we don't know. Let's work on some of the things that you already know. You know how to research contract history. You know how to research um, the agencies. You know how to find the Ostabu. You know how to find the forecast list. Let's work on some of the things that you don't do know. And then when you get to that point, then come back and tell me it's hard. Then you come back and say, hey, look, you know, I met with the person. Nothing happened. That's that's the stories I want to hear. Don't come to me before you've actually done the exercises that I've already shared with you that you already know. Because at that point, I can't really. The only advice I'm going to give you is to do that first. Right. So you've got to do, you know, your fundamentals before you can start getting to the more some of the more advanced techniques like IDIQs and joint ventures and meta protege programs, which is the stuff that I'm really excited about and the stuff that I really want to start talking about. So, again, when you're looking at your activity, um, are you choosing activities based on your level of comfort or are you choosing activities that will yield the maximum return? Before we continue, does anyone have any questions out there? I, uh, I know I just like ran it for about 14 minutes. Um, all right, let's see. Someone says, in hindsight, is there a protection clause for material shortages you've got to put in your contract? Um, well, we're not going to really get into my contract. That's not, that's not important. You know, we want to talk about contracts that people are working on. Um, I don't see anything. Hey, make sure I see there are people watching. You know, Tracy Bird, how are you? South Bronx, Raymond, AAA, we make time. Hey, guys. So, um, all right, looks like no one has any questions. No one has anything they're working on that they want to discuss? No? Anything? Any questions? All right, cool. I'm going to, by the way, we're going to go to probably about seven, so, uh, on this topic, unless um, there's anything in there. All right, so let's, let's move on. All right, so let's talk about, Oh, 
Oh, prolific buyers. So, um, all right, prolific buyers is a question. If you have a similar contract situation, is there a clause you can put in for material shortages? Yeah, unfortunately, when you start working with some of these um, big contractors, they already write up the contracts, so there's not really, they don't allow you to add additional clauses in there. The only thing that, you know, in, in my particular situation, what's going to happen is, so in my situation, what's going to happen on that particular contract is if they penalize me, whatever penalties they, they uh, enforce, uh, impose upon me, I'm just going to pass them down to the, the, the manufacturer. And we've already had this, we've already had this discussion. So, and, you know, in, in terms of that, I'm not afraid because I'm not going to eat the, the money. So, so, you know, one of the things that um, we talk when I talk to people about becoming consultant and working, if you start working with some of these large companies, you'll learn these things. So you'll learn what's called flow down clauses. So whatever clauses they give you, you make them flow down. You make them flow down onto the subcontractor. So um, I learned that because from experience, again, from failing, when I worked in the private sector and I did some projects and I was dealing with my own staff, my own employees, then yeah, I was I uh, I took a forty three thousand dollar hit on a project in Miami before, that the manufacturer um, they penalized me because of the delays and the making decisions, and then at the same time, the owners the owners rep said that you know it was the manufacturer's fault, the manufacturer said it was the owner's rep fault, and so I got stuck with a forty three thousand dollar loss. So yeah. Tracy Bird, I want to share with the group that we were awarded a contract yesterday. Wow, Tracy, congratulations. That is awesome. Everyone congratulate Tracy. Austin, hey, welcome to the chat session tonight. Tracy, congratulations. Um, I can't wait to talk hear all about it. So, um, Austin has a question. What's the importance of the FAR and, and reading all of it? Yeah, um, so the importance of the FAR is... I mean, the, bit, the beauty of the FAR is it's universal and applies to like 90% of all agencies. So that's the advantage. Uh, in terms of reading it verbatim, no, I wouldn't read it. The, the FAR is a reference guide. And so you can't really read it uh, verbatim, like sit down and read it like a book. But, you know, what you want to do is whatever contract you have, you just want to read the clauses that apply to that particular contract. So, you know, don't worry about actually understanding all of the FAR. Just... You know, I've always only focused on the ones that apply to my, you know, to my particular contract at hand because, you know, every contract's different. And so, you know, you go out and you learn about things that you may actually never, they may never apply to you um, in your contract. So, South Bronx, I heard about that. Hmm, I don't really understand. But, yeah, so that's, that's great news, Tracy, today. Thanks for sharing with the group. I appreciate that. Charles, welcome. All right, um, so let's go through a couple of things here. So, um, I have a really uh, quick failure story. Um, I'll share with you guys, I was, um, so what I was doing, and if we want, I see someone ask Tracy about the kind of contract she wants. If Tracy wants, maybe we can, get Tracy on and we can talk to her about this. Not now today, but we can uh, talk offline, Tracy, and see if you want to share with the group about your contract and your award later in another session. If everyone's, if everyone wants that, I'm sure they probably do. Everyone likes to hear the kind of success stories and I love them as well. They're great for sharing with people. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things I remember my very first contract that I did was a metal building contract and, uh, you know, you know, you guys have seen where, you know, I do steel erection contracts, but I, when I got into the industry, I knew nothing about steel buildings. I was relying upon someone else to help me put together the bids, put together the jobs. I brought them in kind of as a consultant. And the very first project that we bid, we bid, um, I made a big mistake. And the project was to build 15 buildings and I bid it to build two buildings. And so, um, Fortunately for me is that even though I bid it to only build two buildings, I still ended up at the end of the day uh, making a profit because um, 
what I did was I benchmarked against what I knew was the like price range to bid the job. So even though my price, my cost initially that I estimated was significantly cheaper, I still bid it at the range of the contract. That way, um, I had myself covered. So, it, it, you know, in short, I thought I was going to make like a million bucks profit, and that didn't happen. And so I didn't even make like 10% of that. But, uh, for, but at the same time, I didn't lose either. So that was a good thing. So, you know, I say that to say, you know, first thing, people think that failure is avoidable. It's not. As long as you're attempting new things, you're going to make mistakes. Um, and if you, you know, one of the things that I, I share with my son is if you don't feel fear in your weekly activities, then you're not being bold. You're not growing. You're not developing. You know, for me, just doing this YouTube live is scary. Um, I may seem comfortable, but I'm not. Trust me. When I first started doing these videos, I was terrified. Um, but I knew that this was the next phase of my development, so I had to do it. Um, you know, number two, people think that failure is an event. Um, it's not. You know, how do you teach kids alphabets? I tell people, and uh, I give another example. In the Zelda, if you're on my, if you subscribe, I tell people that I used to play this game called Zelda. And in the game Zelda, you would go around and you try to like get through a door, and uh, you would try to get to the to the next level, but you've got to find a key to get to the door. And then in order to, you know, find the key, you might have to read a clue, you may have to turn over a rock, and, you know, you look for these hints, but you didn't give up, you know, so you didn't stop because, you know, at this, you went to try the door, it didn't work, and then, you know, you wouldn't stop, you would continue until, you know, you found that key to get to the door, and because you knew that that was just the next step in your journey to reaching your goal of going to the next level, all right? People think the failure is an enemy, it's not. Most people try to avoid failure like the plague. They're afraid of it. But it takes adversity to create success. Um, you know, if you go on YouTube and you watch the story of how the Ferrari car was made, it was invented by a guy named Enzo Ferrari. And so he created the luxurious Ferrari brand that, you know, we know of today, right? So we got Ferraris and Lamborghinis and those are the, like the luxury cars. But at one point in Ferrari's career, when he was in the process of making this car, did you have any idea that they called him a Saturn, which meant devourer of his children? Because after several of his car crashes killed the drivers and the spectators, he was actually indicted for manslaughter charges. Um, he was later acquitted. Um, but, you know, we see the results of the Ferrari today, but we don't realize that all of the stuff that he went through, that he, if, had he given up and had he thought that failure was his enemy, he would have never created it. That's the same thing with building the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, and the Panama Canal. Hundreds, if not thousands, of people died in making these, these landmark monuments that we now um, marvel over today. Number four, people think that failure is irreversible. It's not. In business, um, and I love this quote by Mark Cuban, he says, it doesn't matter how many times you fail, you only have to be run, right once, and then everyone can tell you that you're an overnight success. And I'm going to say this. Um, that's the same thing happened to me is that, you know, no one, I haven't, no one person has said, Eric, let me tell, can you tell me about some of your failures and some of your mistakes? You guys don't realize that a few years ago that I almost went bankrupt. I mean, I made a video about it, but no one even watches it. You know, the difficulties of getting past, uh, you know, potential bankruptcy in your business and in your personal life and, and some of the obstacles that I went through and the challenges and having good people around me and being part of a, a network of millionaires who encouraged me to keep pushing forward and to stay and fight. Um, but, you know, no one ever even bothered asking about that stuff. Um, people think that failure is a stigma. It's not. Do you guys remember when LeBron James left the Cleveland Cavaliers? Does, it, does everyone remember that? And then he went to go play for the Miami Heat. And then what happened? People were burning his jerseys in the streets and everybody went crazy and they tore his name down off the banners and blah, 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 blah. And then after winning with the Heat and coming back to Cleveland, right, now all of a sudden he's a hero, he's at Cleveland, oh my gosh, he's King James, da 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 So again, there, there was obviously the stigma that was placed upon LeBron James is now gone, right? So there's no stigma with failure. And then last but not least, people think that failure is final. And so it's not. The only time that failure is final is when you quit. And as put by Thomas Edison, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. So um, I was uh, on Twitter uh, this week, 
and I saw an interview that was Jeff Bezos from Amazon.com. You guys may or may not know this, but Jeff Bezos is now the richest person in the world. He's taken over Bill Gates' spot um, with the new evaluation of Amazon, and I mean, he he really is taking over the world. I mean, he's you know he's he's you know obviously they bought Whole Foods grocery stores, and now they're going to be um, employing drones and some other really crazy stuff, futuristic things. But Jeff Bezos, um, he said in an interview, he was interviewed by his brother, and they asked him, he used to work at a job, he was an engineer. You may or may not know this, but Jeff Bezos was an engineer, and they asked Jeff Bezos, they said, well, um, what made you leave your job as an engineer and start Amazon? And I thought this was a great message that he said, so much so that I want to share with you guys. And so he said that after pondering for some time, he decided to project his life out to the ripe old age of 80 years old. And then he would take the path that produced the minimum amount of regrets. And the way he saw it is that if he failed, he would be very proud of what he had tried when he was 80 years old. So think about that for a moment. You know, if we project our life out to 80 years old, and then we think at 80 years old that we've done, we've, we've, we've done all the things to create the minimum amount of regrets in our life. And you're not going to regret not going to work. You're not going to regret quitting that job. You're not going to regret, um, you know, those things. You're going you're gonna, to, what you will regret is not seeing all that you can be and being able to go after these contracts. What you're going to regret is not actually making that phone call to the contracting officer. You're going to regret not having um, given that presentation. You're going to regret not having tried to put in a bid for that particular contract. The additional effort, those are the things that you're going to regret. And so this is coming from Jeff Bezos, who's the obviously the number one um, richest person in the world. And I thought that was worth sharing. So we went ahead and talked about um, what FAIR is not. Let's look at some of the benefits of FAIR. I know that we're all social creatures, so it's natural for us to want to conform to the people around us and the norms of the group. But underneath there is a deep fear that sticking out, following our own path, no matter what people think of us. The fearless types are able to conquer this fear. They fascinate us by how far they go with their unconventionality. We secretly admire them and respect them for this. We wish we could act more like they do. And I, and I believe we can. I believe we all can. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to show you that a regular person like me has the ability to work on things that are that change the world that we live in, things that can protect us because I'm working on military bases, secure us, house us, feed people, and these are things that I would have never thought in a million years that I would be doing. I would have never thought in a million years that I would be building uh, test facilities for the government. I would have never thought in a million years that I would be building um, flight training facilities where we're testing out, you know, where we teach pilots how to fly planes that are going to be then, you know, doing uh, missions work over in other overseas and in, in, in Iraq and Iran and places like that. I had no idea um, when I got involved in this. So let's talk about some of the, the, the benefits of failure. And, um, and all these benefits, I use quotes from Helen Keller to kind of uh, emphasize my points. Um, and so, number one, you will learn lessons. Helen Keller says, avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. The fearful are caught as often as the bold. Number two, you will develop boldness, courage, and strength. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Again, Helen Keller. Number three, your experiences will open you up to new possibilities. No pessimist ever discovered the secrets of the stars or sailed to uncharted land or opened a new heaven to the human spirit. And then number four, you move closer to your purpose. I long to accomplish a great and noble task, but it is my chief duty to accomplish small tasks if they were great and noble, Helen Keller. So I, um, I want to leave you guys with that today. I know... Um, this was different than my normal training. This is um, kind of like off the cusp, but I did want to share this because I, I really believe um, that we can build an army of really good contractors out there. I don't 
think that I'm smarter than anybody else. I don't think that I have more ability than anyone else. The only difference between me and you is that I actually tried to do this stuff. Like I made an attempt, I made an effort. Um, and because for me, I have a bigger purpose, right? So that, so inside of me, there's a burning desire to achieve. And so for, for that um, is what drives me. That's what wakes me up in the middle of the night. That's what keeps me going. That's why I'm doing this stuff. That's the same reason why I'm teaching you guys because now I've developed an even greater purpose because of all the feedback that I receive on a day in and day out basis from my subscribers. Every day I, I receive people telling me, you know, congratulatory words. Hey, Tyler, welcome to the group. Um, and so every day I receive uh, these notifications from people signing up, joining, participating. And just like with Tracy winning her award, I'm so happy for her. I, I can't wait till, you know, Austin wins his award, until Louis Reed wins his award, until Sal Bronx wins her award, until Raymond and Natasha and Prolific and, you know, everyone else in this list until you guys are all sharing the same stories. And that's what I do this for. And so the same thing for you. You know, why are you doing this? Why are you here? Why are you spending your time? If, you know, make it count. Make it worth it. Attempt the activities. I've already, I've said this many times before. If you have something, because this has already happened. I had, a, I had a, a, one of my subscribers, he reached out to me and, he, and the government was sending him solicitations. I mean, they were just sending it to him directly and asking for price proposals. But he was intimidated because he, you know, it was a lot of paperwork and he wasn't used to it and he wasn't sure how to handle it. And so he was just not responding. And I don't want that to be you. Um, you know, I don't want that to be you. I don't want you to stand in your own way from achieving the goals that you set for yourself. You know, so get out your way. And, you know, the next time we come on board, let me know about some of your experiences of talking to people, you know, hey, I got my forecast list. Hey, I've set up a meeting. I'm going to go do a presentation for the organization, Sam. I mean, these things, um, you know, I actually, when I first started doing this, I hired um, a person from a workforce program. I don't know if you guys heard of this. It's called Workforce One or Unemployment Workforce, things like that. But when I first started doing forecast lists, I literally hired a, a person that went, they went from like welfare to work. And so you basically, uh, whatever you paid them, the government would reimburse you for hiring that person. So you pay them a salary and then the government then cut you a check back for that salary. So the very first person that I ever trained to pursue forecast lists and do government research was a person from a welfare to work program. And so I say that um, because I, I want you to know it's possible for all of us out there. It's, this is a real thing. And so if I can take someone that's from a, work, uh, a welfare to work program who has zero knowledge about government contracts and zero experience, all I did was sit down with her and train her how to make these phone calls. And I would just get on the phone and I would show her examples and I write down scripts um, and then I would tell her, we'd go through and practice and in the beginning she was very nervous, she was very scared. I'd say, Eric, you know, I can't make the calls, I can't make the calls. And I go, look, practice with me. And then we would, we, we would just pretend, you know, she'd get on one phone call, I, you know, she'd get it, put a phone to her ear, I'd put on the phone and say, hey, hello, hello, okay, this is Eric. Hey, I said, hey, this, um, what was her name? Tiffany, Tiffany was her name. Okay, I said, hey, hey, Tiffany, how are you today? Hey, great, listen, um, you know, and then we would just go through the scripts and we'd go through the exercises and that's how um, she learned about, you know, calling upon out contracting officers and, and calling upon small business specialists to get these forecast lists. And um, she turned out to be the best person because once she got past her fear, man, she, you know, I would leave and we go to lunch and come back and she said, hey, I got three more um, forecast lists from these different agencies. These are the products coming up. And so, um, you know, she would, she would produce the information that I needed. And this was just um, a person that I got from welfare to work. Charles, so your question is, do they still have any of these programs? I'm sure they do. Uh, they always do because the government, the government, again, the, they want to help people transition into the workforce. I don't know that, I don't know if they're still called welfare to work programs anymore. They probably have different names now, but if you go to what we have here is called one-stop centers. If you go to your local uh, workforce employment or employment workforce, something along that line, if you, if you go to one of those particular groups, then um, you can inquire about the different programs they have for hiring, you know, people. 
Uh, I know that they had programs for hiring inmates and you know that kind of stuff like that, prisoners and different programs. But you know the one that I used was called Welfare to Work, and it worked out great. Let's see, I have a question here. Are you familiar with the incumbent bid process for drop shipping? Also, the calculator that that's needed for your market. If so, can you elaborate on it? All right. Um, I don't really understand the question for the uncommon bid process for drop shipping. I would need a more specific example. The calculator that's needed for your markup, yes. So I have um, spreadsheets. Now, um, AAA week make, that's, that's a very good question. This is one of the reasons why I tell people to become a consultant first or you know, become, work as a subcontractor or work underneath a prime contractor is because they will give you a lot of this information. So I have a spreadsheet that I use to calculate my markup, and it comes from someone that you know I got it via. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same kind of spreadsheet that the government uses, um, and it tells you. And it, but it's it's specific to, you know. I I mean I'm in the I'm in the service business, so it's very specific to that. Um, but yeah, I have a I have a spreadsheet that's calculated for markup. But if you don't have a spreadsheet used to calculate markup, remember what I taught you in Fed Biz Ops. Go back and. And all you have to do is start looking at some of the bids and what people are marking them up. I mean, if you know your business and you know what you sell, then go back and look at the bids and look at the pricing, and you can see right away uh, how people are marking up those contracts. Um, to me, that's a very straightforward process because, again, even though my jobs were not put on Fed Biz Ops, they are put on USA Spending and they are put on FPDS, um, Federal Procurement Data System. So you can still go back and research the products that I worked on. Uh, but you can't, you won't learn about them before they're already awarded. So you'll find out after the fact, but you won't find out beforehand. So, so yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, if I were, if I were in your case, or if I was looking at how to market a job, I would just go back and pull up a bunch of contracts that were similar and look at how, you know, how the range of bids came in. In fact, that's why when I underbid that job, my first hanger, when I bid two to construct two buildings versus the 15 buildings, I knew that my price range had to be around $2 million. So even though um, the price that I requested from the manufacturer was to construct two buildings, and let's say I think it came in at like 400 grand, I didn't bid 500 grand to the government because I knew that the anticipated range for that project was 2 million. So that's why I ended up saving face and not losing money because um, you know I had an idea of where the price should be. So, and I, I actually made a video Last week, um, the guy who does my production editing, he's putting it together. Well, we, we walked through an example like that um, on there. So uh, We're right around 51 minutes now, guys. So I'm taking in questions anybody may have. Anything? Anybody? Hey, I, got, I see some more people come on. Hey, if you guys just come on, uh, we have someone here that won their first contract. Well, I won't say she won her first contract, but she won a contract yesterday, Tracy. So, so congratulate Tracy for winning her first contract with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and let's see. Oh, feminine care products. Nice. And check in and say hi to the group while we're here. By the way, we're going to do this every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so make sure you check in. next. If you missed today's, no worries. Come in on Thursday. All right, I have a meeting next week to present to a group on how I can help obtain federal contract. So many advice from the issue. Charles, um, we, need, we, we had to talk about that. Hey, three triple three transport, you're very welcome. Elmer, thanks for, uh, yeah. Thanks. No, I'm, I'm glad I can um, um, be encouraging. Yeah, I, that's, you know, that, this is real, people. I mean, you know, it's it's. I'm encouraging because it's real. I deal with it every day, um, and like I said, I have. It's not just me. I have four. It's four. I have four friends of mine. Um, three of my three of my travel buddies, and they all do government contracts. And I mean, everyone's successful. Because once you once you get into this, uh, and once you once you become the incumbent, the incumbent, excuse me, then the government's going to start calling you. For contracts, the government's going to start reaching out to you for contracts, and then it just, just, just comes, it just snowballs from there. I mean, at that point, it would have to, um, 
you you would be the you would have to be the one that that messed it up at that point. So you know the government is going to start reaching out to you for contracts once you become the company and you show them that you can produce. Let's see. All right, Raymond. Oh, okay, when will Tracy and I do the interview? Well, I haven't spoken to Tracy yet, uh, but I will say, Tracy, I don't know if you're still on here. She did reach out to me today, but I'm sure now, you know, based on this, she knows why I didn't respond back to her because I, uh, um, because of the phone call I had to deal with today. I had my own, you know, situation to deal with. Remember, listen, hey, this doesn't pay my bills. So I gotta, I gotta take care. Of, I gotta feed the family and take care of the house first before I can um, do this other stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll find out. Natasha, you got a solicitation today. I got a phone call. They're asking me to submit a quote. You call me because I showed interest in price. Hey, Natasha. Now that is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So Natasha just wrote that she got a solicitation. Well, Natasha, you did exactly what I'm saying. This is, this is a great story. By the way, thanks for sharing she says that she got a solicitation. To, uh, a solicit I'm so excited, I can't even talk. She received a solicitation today, because a phone call, and they're asking her to submit a quote because she showed interest in a prior similar solicitation. This is what I'm telling you guys. If you show, like I said, if you take and um, you show people interest, we talked about this, the letter of interest on Fed Ops, right? If you start showing people interest, that's how they get to know you. I mean, Everything that I'm telling you, I've done it, and it's worked. And so that's what I'm saying. I, I'm not. It, it. This stuff works. But Natasha, that's amazing. I want to hear that story. Um, would you consider Legal Shield good protection for a business doing contracts? Tyler, I, I would say no. I don't know Legal Shield because what I what I say is again, if you know all of my contracts, Emmanuel. Hey, welcome to the group. Um, what I say is uh, all the contracts that I use, they came from my prime contractors. So every contract that I have in my arsenal came from some big giant company. And I just, you know, change the names, change the entities, change the price, change everything. So, you know, I would, uh, you know, that's the way that I do it. Um, everything that I'm sharing, all the information, like for example, I have joint venture agreements already. And the joint venture agreement alone, the, in terms of, you know, the legal, it, what it costs is probably five to seven thousand dollars for some attorneys to write it up, and I got it for free. So you know that's why I encourage you. If you start working with companies, the same documents and contracts they give you, you just take those same documents. And I literally took the PDF document, I sent it. You see my video on Guru.com, right? So I took the video, I took the document, I sent it to someone over in I don't know uh, the Philippines. And I had them transcribe the document, take it from PDF and put it into a Word file. And then I just replaced the information, put my name on it and put my header, put my logo. And it became my contract. Hey, if it's good enough for a $100 million company, it's good enough for me. So, and it didn't cost me anything except the cost to take the information and, and have it converted from PDF to, to Word, which I think was like literally was really cheap. I mean, I think it was, it was super cheap. I mean. I don't know, maybe 50 bucks, 40 bucks, maybe cheaper than that. Um, so, anybody else? All right, so Tracy says, if you have not taken Eric's credit card, please take it. I did, and I can say it was day 12, those who took it. You know what day 12 is. That's correct. Um, thanks, Tracy, for those kind words. I appreciate it. You know, I mean, I, I, I really, I want to make this stuff, I want to make, I want to make it better. I want to make it more relevant. Um, so I, I want to um, make it more in depth. Um, you know, like I've got some ideas of mine. I want to maybe do some sample phone calls with people, maybe do some phone scripts and things like that. So, um, so, you know, I, I need, that's why I'm, I'm asking for your feedback because I want to know what worked, what didn't work. And I, and if I need you guys to do the activities so we can kind of like fine tune them and then we'll have a program that's worth something. And then that'll be substantial. Can you imagine if everyone that even today, if um, 
Uh, Elmer, can I get your fear code to refer back to today? Yeah, I can. Um, I'll see how I can can make that. How I can do that. Uh, send me an email so I can remind me. But um, what I was saying is, can you imagine if everyone that today is on this channel? Um, how do we, if we, if we all took and we were doing $5 million in revenue, I mean, right now you're talking about, let's say there's 15 people watching actively at this particular moment. So what is that? Uh, $75 million in contracts. You know, imagine what that would be like if we took that back to our communities. Imagine what that be, how, what kind of impact would that be, um, on our friends and our family and the other people that, you know, the lives that we try to reflect. So, you know, I'm just saying to you guys that this is not unrealistic. I tell you this every day. If you don't know this already, the government spends $1.2 billion a day. Um, and if you go through my 12 day course, I'll show you where to find that information. I'll show you how it works. So they spend $1.2 billion a day. So for you and I to do $5 million, no one won't even know who we are. They won't even know our names. They won't know anything. So, um, you know, I, 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 I say this to say, you guys don't know who my friends are because in the grand scheme of things, they're nobody. I mean, yeah, there's someone to their families, obviously, right? So, you know, God loves them and all this good stuff. But in terms of the government, they're not going to make the news. They're not on TV. They're not, um, they're not in anywhere, any other public forums that you would find them or hear about them because it's, they're, this is just what we do for a living. And if I didn't make these videos, you wouldn't know about me either. 333 Transport, my course is absolutely 100% free. Costs you nothing to sign up, costs you nothing to register. Completely free. But um, I don't know how much longer I'm going to make. I'm just going to be free because I want people to do the activities. And I, and I believe that if I charge a small fee, maybe you guys would take it serious and do the actual activities. But... Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I'm playing with that idea. You know, I, I want it to be free, but at the same time, I want people to get the results. And I and I, in order for them to get the results, sometimes you got to pay a little bit of money to do it. So, I'm uh, again, like I said, I'm. This is an experimentation for me. I'm. I'm really. Let me see if I can grab the the link for the course. Hold on, guys. Give me a second. Let me go into my notebooks and see if I can grab the link to the course. Sign you guys up real quick. By the way, for all you people, go franchise career. Okay. There you go. That's the link for the course. I just put it in there. Oh, Natasha, this just happened after 3 p.m.? Wow. That is amazing. Let me know, Natasha, if you need anything. Well, you know your business better than I do, but um, send me an email and let me know if you need anything. Definitely want to take a... Everyone, make sure you congratulate Natasha. Emmanuel, can you please congratulate Natasha? Um, everyone congratulate her. This is... You know, and... And this is what I tell you about standing out from the crowd. You know, a lot of people spend a lot of time bidding jobs on FedBest Ops. And I, and Tracy, she knows this, I tell them. You've got to, you've got to do a mixture of, you know, if you just bid contracts, bid contracts, bid contracts, what you'll, what you'll find is you'll get burned out really easily just bidding projects. So just by bidding projects, it's not going to get you the results. You have to express an interest, get the people to know who you are, and let them know that you, you know, you provide this service. And that's the same thing I was telling you about one of my other subscribers. The government knew who he was and they knew the service he provided. So they were sending him direct solicitations um, that never made FedBiz Ops. It like exactly what Natasha said. Hey, they didn't post that to FedBiz Ops. They sent it directly to her. And the same thing with my other YouTube subscriber. They didn't post it on FedBiz Ops. Let me tell you why. The reason why they didn't post this stuff on FedBiz Ops is because the government has to do what's called mission critical tasks. And for those, you, you know, by the way, learn the lingo. The lingo is very important. Mission critical. If you want to take notes on anything today, write mission critical. Um, so when it's mission critical, that means they don't have 
the opportunity. If if you live in Miami, you live in Broward, and you were part of the hurricane, you live in Puerto Rico, do you want to wait for the government to bid out a contract to redo your lighting, to clean up the trash, to clean up debris? Do you want to actually wait for them to figure out who's going to charge the best price? Or do you want them already to have things in place to get it, to execute it and to make it happen right away? Same thing. So whenever you see that the government has, uh, there's, 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 and I, and I have a, a potential video coming up on that. There are certain exceptions to the rule in the FAR that prevents them or permits them to not put items in FBO because they are considered mission critical or they meet certain criteria. And henceforth, you know, if we have, if someone, if something happens tomorrow, a, a disaster or some devastation, a fire or explosion, the government needs to be able to take action and to bring resources and people and, and mobilize equipment and stuff on site immediately. And so they got to have people in place to already do that. So, so in order for them to be able to do these things, then guess what? Um, they can't go and bid it out. They don't have time. They don't have time to bid it out. They don't have time to give everyone an opportunity. Um, that's correct. Mission critical expedite. Yeah. So, so that, so the, in, in a nutshell, what you'll find is a lot of times they would use that when they are writing up uh, jobs and you'll find that they'll kind of, as they get to know you, they'll use, um, again, I'm not a contracting officer. I don't want to, you know, say anything bad about contracting officers, but what they'll do is more often than not, they'll start using, um, those particular clauses to find ways to get you to, to do the work because it makes it easier on them. If you are a contracting officer, you're a contracting agent, they're government employees. And so what happens? They want to take the path of least resistance. So if, if Natasha does a good job with this particular agency, you know, she's going to have the contract and she's going to get more contracts and more contracts and she's going to become the incumbent. And so then what happens at that point? She becomes the incumbent and now she becomes the big guy. She's the guy that everyone's chasing, right? So she, she becomes the person that you are all chasing, saying, hey, why does Natasha get all the work? Why does Natasha get all the contracts? How come Natasha, you know, she becomes that person who you guys are chasing after and wanting to look up to. And then, you know, she can come on here and on the show and, and interview and talk about the same type of experiences. So that that's what happens, you know. But again, it only happens when you you get past your fear, you get past your anxiety, and you start taking action steps. All right, guys. Um, anything else? I'm about five minutes of my time. I mean, I'm having fun with you guys, but you know, it's kind of late. And I, unless um, there's anything we have. Hey, Natasha. Make sure you send me an email. Um, Elmer Foster. Hey, listen. Make sure you send me an email also regarding the quote, so that way we can I can remember it. Um, I didn't actually take any notes, so. Anybody else? Anything else? Any other good news? I love these success stories. They're great. This is good for the group. Very healthy. Okay, guys. Hey, listen. Uh, thanks for watching today. I really appreciate it. Um, same Thursday, 6 p.m. Thanks, Triple Three Transport. Hey, Thursday, 6 p.m. Um, I'll see you guys, and we'll talk about another subject. All right? I'm signing out. Talk to you soon.